ever How great the pain of searing loss The Father turned his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulder Ashamed to hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath hath brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Amen Amen Boy, any good tonight, gang. Praise God for salvation. What a wonderful thing to be born again. Did you see the Holy Ghost this morning reaching towards the lost? Sir, God was trying to get them lost. See, my dear family, until a lost person gets really lost, they're not going to come to Christ. Once they find out how lost they really are, you can't stop a sinner from coming to Christ, or you can't stop them from repenting, you can't keep them away from God once they truly understand how lost they are. So sometimes they just got to be hammered. And that's what God Almighty did this morning. He hammered on the lost people this morning. I pray they never forget it. I pray it just haunts them and brings them to Jesus Christ. We may not see their salvation, but we don't have to see it here. As long as they get in and get up, get up to house, that's all I care about. Let's look in our Bibles tonight, please. First Timothy chapter 1 and Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to start now building on this thing, so just stay with me, all right, for these days together. First Timothy chapter 1, first of all, that's our verse for the week, if you will. Let's stand together, the 18th verse, First Timothy chapter 1. I'll tell you what let's do now. We've got, we've got uh, 5.30 tomorrow night, a meal together. Y'all got a meal together, and uh, I don't eat before I preach because uh, I can't, all right? But I'll be in there pestering you while you eat, all right? How about that? And uh, and then let's do this, all right? When y'all done eating and stuff, about quarter till, let's go to prayer. All right, tomorrow night and every night, let's just go to prayer about quarter to seven. And uh, we'll just uh, pray and, and get a hold of God. And if we come out of the prayer room, it's fine. And if we just pray the whole service, that'll be fine too. It don't make no, never mind. Amen. First Timothy, please, chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, According to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And that's what we're dealing with this week, is that war, that attack by force, if you will, that contest of violence. 
And that's what war is. War is violence, my dear family. I want you to understand that. War is not a party. War is violent. It is, it is, it is rude. It is crude. It is, it is, listen, uh, for some of us that understand this terminology, it is just old fashioned down home street fighting. Okay? It's not a gentleman's fight. Back in Europe in the old days, they had a gentleman's fight. You know what that was? No officers was allowed to be shot. Secondly, they just lined up across the field within firing distance of each other, and the last man standing determined the winner. In case you don't know, that's not how the enemy fights us. He's a dirty fighter. He kicks, he bites, he scratches, he stands behind rocks and trees, he, he does everything in his power. He sets snares, landmines, bombs, scud missiles. He does everything in his power. He has suicide bombers. I'm not talking about the religion of you know who. I'm talking about the devil. I'm talking about the enemy of your soul and mine, the enemy of your Christian walk and mine. He's a dirty fighter. And the only way to whip that rascal is be just as radical as he is. And that's what I try to get us to do this morning is to declare war on sin. Man. Man. And when we do that, we must name sin straight up. We must name its author as I tried to do this morning. We must name its tactics as I tried to do this morning. We must name him as he is. Don't candy coat him, soft coat him. He is the devil. God called him the devil. God called him Satan. Don't slew foot him, don't little man in the red suit and the pitchfork, call him like he is. Tell him like he is. Deal with him like he is. Listen, if he'll poke you in the eye, poke him in the eye. You got it? You say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying resist the devil, he'll flee from you, but if he don't flee, punch him. Punch him right in the mouth. Listen, he's endeavoring to get you messed up. So mess him up. So how do I do that the best? Remind him he lost you. Anybody say you here tonight besides me? Amen. Remind that idiot that he lost you. Remind him of the day you got born again. Say by the grace of God. That grates on him worse than anything in the world to realize he cannot put you in hell tonight. Bless God for that. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 4, the 17th verse. Nehemiah 4.17, God Almighty says, They which builded on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, everyone. Now look at this thing. There's wall builders, there are burden bearers, and there are toters, all right, ladens. Everyone with his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. I want to bring you a message tonight. God, my helper, on war, work, and weapons. Work and weapons tonight. I'm going to do with two facets of the message tonight. I'm going to deal with the work and I'm going to deal with weapons that you and I can use. All right? Let's go to war. You ready? Let's go to war. Father, Lord, as we walk, march behind you in this battlefield tonight, Lord Jesus, we ask you to win the victory, Father. You know, Lord Jesus, the, the cost of the soul of man. You know, Heavenly Father, the fight that the people of God are going through at this very moment. You know, Lord Jesus, the battle lines are drawn. You know that the cannon fire is raging. And Heavenly Father, you know the enemy better than we do. I'm asking you, my Lord, as we follow you into this battlefield, that, Lord, you show us, our God and our Savior, that which you want us to learn. Because, Heavenly Father, tomorrow when we get up and go our separate ways, Father, we'll be on the battlefield with you again, but we'll be doing the fighting tomorrow, Lord, at our shops, our schools, our grocery stores, wherever it is. And Father in heaven, we must understand that we are, according to Christ, the winners. You said in your Bible, Lord Jesus, that you always cause us to triumph. We always win. I would to God we learn that. I would to God we'd understand that, that we are the winner. We've won the battle, the big major battle. We've won it. We've surrendered our authority, trusted Christ as our Savior. We're born again, blood-bought children of God and the army of God, and who can defeat God? Heavenly Father, help us 
Be ready for tomorrow's battles by listening to tonight's instructions. We pray for it in Jesus' name this evening. Amen, my Father. Amen. You may be seated, family. This is a story, as you well know. There's nothing new under the sun. You know as well as I the story of Nehemiah and the great wall of, of Jerusalem that he was a building over there. And I'm just going to stay right in Nehemiah chapter 4. We'll go right down through this thing. All right, God laid it all right out there in front of me. Uh, what day? Well, yeah, let's see. Today's Sunday. Yesterday afternoon, God laid this all right down in front of me for you tonight. You and I, my dear family, are in work. Can I say this without hurting you too awful bad? Uh, there's no entitlement mindedness in Christianity. Nobody's allowed to sit with their hands out. Everybody's in the work. Amen. Everybody's in the battle. One way or the other, everybody's in the battle. We're praying, we're preaching, we're singing, we're reading our Bibles, we're, we're in the house of God, we're giving, we're doing something. We're doing something in the work of God. There is no such thing as sitting around doing nothing in the work of God Almighty. It is work. God Almighty told us in the Bible and over and over and over, many different places, work. For the day, for the night is coming and work and, and do work and, and work. And so as you and I work for the Lord Jesus Christ, we've never had a better boss. We've never had better benefits. We've never had a better work. Uh, place. We've never had better work ethics. Uh, I mean, everything about working for God is a blessing. Everything about that. You say, why, preacher? Because my dear family, he is in charge, he is in control, and he is in guard of all of us at all times. Thank God he guards us while we work for him. Now, I've been in some pretty hairy situations, and I was looking for God in them situations, uh, especially working in the streets of America, and I've been in some pretty, pretty scary places, but my God has come through. Here I stand before you tonight without a bruise. I want you to know God is in charge of his children. You're not running this race alone. You're not working this work this alone. You're not in this field by yourself. Listen to me, you're not the only cotton picker in the cotton picking field, okay? God's here, all right? He's with us every step of the way. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, he says. It'll be all right. Let's go together. Let us, he says in the Bible many times, especially in Hebrews, let us, let us, let us, let us. He's with us in every facet of this life. And as you and I work for God, we find, first of all, if you will, please, there is a war against the building of a Christian life. Let's look first of all at the hindrance of it, if we may. Verse 8 and verse 11, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 8 says these words. They conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. They did not want the wall built. They do not want you to build a Christian life that's worth living. They do not want you to live a testimonious life. They know it's God's testimony and not yours. They know because there's only two testimonies in the whole world, either the devil or God. And when you're living for Jesus Christ, it's God's testimony because it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is God in you, working in you, that which is to his good will and to his good pleasure. But they don't want that, so they try to hinder it. Verse 11 says, Our adversaries said they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. The opposition are at war against your building of your Christian life. And they infiltrate the ranks. Are you listening to me? I study a lot about war, you know, Second World War, uh, Civil War especially. I, I study a lot of that. I, I, I love studying war and I, and I watch and I see infiltration. It was one of the tactics of the enemy to infiltrate the troops. Get inside of this thing. Many a story about the infiltration where they, they learned our language and learned our ways and got in our uniforms and was parachuted behind our lines and got in our platoons and got in our armies and, and on and on and on and took over this and took over that only to destroy that which was there. So listen, gang, your enemy is a destroyer. You gotta get that. He's not, he's not a builder. He's not trying to build nothing. He's trying to destroy you. Are you listening to me, gang? He has nothing to build. He knows his time is short. He knows his days are numbered. He knows he's a doomed, condemned, and damned devil. You got that? He knows that. He is not trying to build anything. He is simply endeavoring to destroy. His entire process of life is to destroy men's lives. 
to destroy people's lives, to destroy their health. Are you listening to me? To, to, to the point where he could get them to die without Christ and go to hell. He is not building hell. Okay, I heard a guy one time say the devil's building hell. Yeah, he ain't building hell. He is not a builder. He is a destroyer. Your enemy, my enemy, the enemy of our Christian life is a destroyer. He comes to seek and to kill and to destroy. That's what he does. He does not want to build anything. He is not building devil churches. He is simply hindering people from coming to Christ. Just, just like certain ones in our segment of society. They have nothing to build, so they spend their entire days destroying everybody around them. Right. Gang, I'm telling you right now, the devil is a destroyer. And if he puts a hindrance on your Christian walk, why don't you wake up to the fact, why have I slowed down? What is going on in my life that I've slowed down? You need to look around because behind every tree and rock is a devil. Right. Now, I'm going to bust a bubble here, all right? I'm going to bust a bubble. There's a plague. <clears throat> There's a disease. God help me. There's a... Uh, There's a cancer infiltrating our churches that is producing a non-responsibility amongst the people of God. Can I give it to you? You cannot blame everything that goes on on a spirit. There are those preaching that in our land. That's the spirit of this and the spirit of that and the spirit of this and the spirit of that. But I'm here to tell you right now, there ain't a spirit of hell that has domination over an obedient child of God. Amen. Not one. Amen. Nowhere. Right. The devil cannot cough up a demon a devil, Bible term devils, he cannot cough up a devil that can overthrow the child of God who is obedient to his Lord. Well, the spirit of this made me do it. No, the spirit of nothing made you do nothing. You deliberately rebelled against God knowing better, and you did it on yourself. If you'd have just said no to the devil, he'd have had to flee from you. If you just said no to that devil, that little devil, if you will, my dear family, he couldn't have made you do nothing. Well, preacher, I got in the flesh and couldn't help myself. That's a lie. You're not in the flesh if the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. You're in the Spirit. Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Are you a child of God? Yes or no? Then you do not have an excuse for sin. I know, I know where we're on the... I know what I'm telling them too. There is no excuse for sin except pure rebellion and the part of the child of God. There is a Holy Ghost of God inside every believer that does not let us get to sin and then deal with us. He deals with us before we ever do get to sinning. So there's no excuse for us saved people. Now we'll give it to the lost. Because they're of their father the devil and the lusts of their father they will do. That's what God Almighty told a bunch of religious idiots yonder in John chapter 8. But I'll tell you point blank, you and I as God's people have no excuse for sinning. When we get saved by the grace of God, we get out of the sinning business. We are saints that sin. We're not sinners. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Brother Don, there's a song that says, uh-huh, there is a song that says, but there's another song that says, I was once a sinner, but then I came. I'm going to choose that song. If you want to sing, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, you go ahead and stay in that sad attitude. I'm not going to do it. I was once a sinner, but I came. I'm going that route. <laughs> Go on out there and cry in your soup all you want to about sinning. I'm not going to join you. Why, preacher? Because I know the war is a hindrance to my Christian walk. And when I'm slowed down in my Christian walk, when I'm hindered about my Christian walk, my dear family, I want you to realize right now, it is I who have let them slow me down. I am a free will agent. I'm not a robot or a mannequin or a puppet on a string. The devil doesn't do this to me. He doesn't do that to you. You're a child of the king. You're not some peasant in a shack somewhere in the grass hut. You're a child of the king. 
You've got the power of God on you, in you, around you, and near you. All you've got to do is submit to God and say, God Almighty, I don't want to be slowed down. I don't want to be hindered. I don't want the Sambouts and Tobias of this world to stop me from building my Christian life. So I'm going to stand up and stand for God and do what right. Lord, help me. My spirit's willing. My flesh is weak. But God, you can overcome this for me. Help me, God, and you can stand strong and true if you want to. If you want to. The question is in our day, gang, our gangs are getting so lazy they don't want to no more. Look with me, please, if you will, not only a war of hindrance in verse 8 and 11, but I want you to look at the collected enemies. Bible says in verse 2, he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria. Who did? Sam Ballard of verse 1. Notice now, it just ain't got one enemy. Sam Ballard spake before his brethren. And the army of the Samarians said, what do these feeble Jews, what are these Christians trying to prove? Hey, have you heard the latest scuttlebutt in Panama City? That lighthouse crowd thinks they can have revival. Are they stupid or what? Come on, it's the same principle. The principle is the enemies of Christianity here in Nehemiah chapter 4, the enemies by the family of our Christianity in 2014, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in the day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Verse 3, now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. Sam Ballot, his brethren... The army of the Samaria, of the Samaria, and now we got Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, notice how it all filters down upon each other. He said, even that which they build, a fox grew up here, she even break down the stone wall. Notice the collection of the enemies. You say, what are you saying, preach? I'm saying birds of a feather flock together. They're going to attack, and they're going to attack a force. But let me ask you a simple question. Do you think four could whip a thousand? This is yes, even in Panama City. So picture four, uh uh-huh. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and you. You think you can whip a thousand? I believe you can. I believe you can make it. I believe you can serve God. I believe you can build. I believe you can go into this war knowing that you're going to win it. Simply because you know the end results of this thing. You done read the end of the book. We already know how it ends out, my dear family. Over yonder there in chapter 20, my dear ones, I want you to know something. The devil gets cast into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the beast is. We've done one this thing. Why in the name of sense are you and I bleeding to death? We're bleeding to death. Somebody needs to scream for a medic. Why, preacher? To plug up the holes, for crying out loud. The world, the flesh, and the devil has shot us full of holes, and they've, they've ganged up. Listen, some of you look like Swiss cheese tonight. You've been letting the Sam Ballots and Tobias talk you out of serving God, talk you out of being faithful to church, talk you out of reading your Bible, talk you out of praying, talk you out of witnessing, talk you out of carrying tracks. Listen, we've let the world talk us out of being who we are. When are you and I going to realize, show there's more of them than they are of us? What's that got to do with power? Come on, think what the Holy Ghost just told you. Did you hear what he said? What does their number got to do with our power? You know as well as our power is not in ourselves. We know that. That's our God. Amen. Is God on our side or not? If God be for us, who can be against us? Is that right? When you go to work tomorrow, you're going to go dragging in here like an old worn out Christian. You're going to go marching in here like an army man. You gonna to go to work tomorrow morning praising God and shouting the victory, singing the songs of Zion, or are you gonna to go to work, oh God, it's Monday again? Everybody around you says, Oh God, it's Monday. Why don't you change the attitude of your shop? Amen. Brother Don, they play bad music on the radio. So what? Play good music in your heart. Amen. Brother Don, it wears on me. Why? 
Tell me why, dear saint of God. Tell me why the collective enemies that gathered up a preacher, I'm the only one in my place that's saved by the grace of God. Why do you think you're there? To win that rest of that bunch to Jesus. You know what will help you if you win one of them to God while you're there? Can you imagine what would happen if you won somebody to God while you work? I wonder if it would spread. I wonder if you could start reviving a Honda dealership. Wouldn't that be a trip? So, I thought uh, revival starts at church. No, revival starts at an individual. The brother said so. We've been talking about it for two days now. The individual's where the revival comes in. You can take revival to the shop tomorrow and shock them right out of their shoes. Wouldn't it be a wild thing? Revival started at a grade school tomorrow. Huh? Miss yes. Sheila come walking in there just praising God and shouting the victory. Amen. All them youngers looking up and say, what in the name of sins? Well, I, I got revival. I'm revived. I, I was a little down, but I'm not today. I'm up today. I'm going today. I'm happy today. I'm happy in Jesus today. I'm praising the Lord today. Preacher, we're allowed to do that. Says who? We're allowed to say that. Uh -huh, no, uh, there ain't no law in the world against it. You go right on and do it. There's somebody somewhere along the line said, you're not allowed to do that anymore. And everybody said, well, I guess we're not allowed to do that anymore. Hogwash. You're allowed to serve God anywhere God Almighty says, praise me. Stand there and raise your hand. You say, what are they doing? What are they doing? I'm praising the Lord. I'm glad you asked. So, said, Brother Don, you're out of your mind. No, I'm not out of my mind. I'm just sick to death of dead Christians. Amen. I'm just sick to death of not having revival. I'm sick to death of people that pout and cry and bellyache and gripe and complain and moan and groan all the time, and they've got a holy God inside of them just like everybody else does. You can shout the victory and praise the Lord. Listen to me, my dear family. You're not allowed to pray here. You can't keep me from praying. You can't tell me I can't pray over my dinner. It's my dinner time. I can pray. Yeah, but you're on the clock. Well, you can't keep me from praying. What are you looking down at? I'm not looking down. I'm talking to my Jesus. I'm thanking him for this bony sandwich. Amen. Amen. Well, this world's got this idea. All they got to do is speak, and we got to cower to them. They want to hinder our work. They want to collect and say, well, listen, the majority rules around here. No, the majority does not rule. God rules. The majority does not dictate what happens. They don't dictate policy. Listen, even our great America does not believe that now. Preachers, this is a democracy. No, it's not. It's a constitutional republic. He said, preacher, democracy rules. No, it don't. We didn't want Obamacare, and he shoved it down our throats anyhow. Tell me democracy rules. No, sir. Somebody raises their mouth. This little percent of people raise a stink, and the whole world cowers down. ACLU or any other bunch of devils raise a stink, and the whole world collapses and caves into them. No, my love. We serve our God. We go on with our God. We live for our God. We be with our God. You guys go fly a kite. I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to serve my God, and you ain't stopping me. And Nehemiah just told him, go fly a kite. Listen, he wants you to come down here to oh no. He said, oh no. I ain't doing it. I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I ain't got time to fool with you boys. Go back over yonder there and kiss your papa. Leave me and God alone. The collective enemies of our day, look for me, please, if you will, verse 4. Nehemiah know what to do, gang. Nehemiah know what to do. Not give in, not quit, throw in the towel, chuck it in. No, sir, he went to God. That's what you and I need to do. And I hear that's what y'all been doing around here. Go to God, go to God, go to God. Nehemiah said, hear, O oh, our God. We're despised. And turn their reproach. Look what he says. And turn their reproach upon their own head. And give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Cover not their iniquity. Let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. See, my dear family, this thing's of God. Amen. This set of church services this week is of God. And if God wants them to go on, they go on. He ain't got a thing to do with me or you or the preacher, none of us. It's God that's going to dictate what happens, not you and me. 
And if God wants to cut it off tonight, if tonight's the last night, that's God's business. If God wants to go tomorrow night, that's God's business. If God wants to go Tuesday, that's God's business. And He got a thing to do with you and I. You and I are the obedient servant of God. He's the first. Don't you play to win? Listen, we got a sissified society today, a feminine minded society. And their philosophy is it doesn't matter whether we win or lose as long as everybody plays. Well, that ain't how us old timers did it. When I was a little feather playing Little League Baseball, we did not go to the ball field to make sure everybody played. The only time that happened when we was about 40 to 1. And then my dad, who was a coach, he put all those, all those first stringers out. After we batted a couple of innings left-handed, we was all right-handed, we batted left-handed, struck out, found out it was terrible. He'd finally take us all out. He said, boys, we can't do this anymore. We've got to get them a chance. So he'd take all of us out and set us on the bench. he put all the other fellows that never did play, he put them in. He played to win. He did not play to lose. Frisco won the World Series, right? Did they drag it out to seven games? They always try to do that, you know, for the sake of the money. Did they play to lose? NASCAR's winding out. Are them boys racing to lose? Do they deliberately drive around and track with the brakes on? No. You know what's really sad? Our great America has been going to war since 1950 to lose. The United Nations wouldn't let us win in Korea. Let us win in Nam. We compromise and give in and cave in now to the Al Qaeda. Instead of making parking lots, you've got 12 hours because within a 100 mile radius of this place is going to be a parking lot in 12 hours. Instead of winning the war, we're playing with it. That philosophy's come over into the house of God. Instead of winning the war, don't get shook up. I know where I'm at. I am not cowering because of a camera. They've not let us win the battles since 1950. Right. I am not a United Nations citizen. Right. I am a United States citizen. Amen. Amen. So what, Don, you cause a war? I'm trying to declare war. Amen. War, not against the government, but against the sin that has eat our government alive. It has tore us up since the forties. It's messed up the school system. We need to proclaim and declare war against the sin that's in our school system. Right. What's the greatest sin of the school system, preacher? No God. Right. No God in a public school system. The government indoctrination stations won't allow God in that school. And yet, my dear family, listen to me, it's crazy. The Supreme Court won't allow to take commandments on a building in some other place, but they have to take commandments in the Supreme Court building. They're hypocrites. They're liars. And I declare war. It's time we stood up for what's right. It's time we quit letting the Sam Bottles and Tobias tell us we can't build a wall. We're going to build a wall. I'm going to live my Christian life with or without you. I'm going to live my Christian life whether you hinder me or not. I'm going to live my Christian life whether you persecute me or not. Greater than I have been killed for the cause of Christ. I'm a nobody. But I'm telling you, guys, we need to stand and stand together. We need to stand on the wall together. We need to play to win. Hear, oh, our God. We are despised. Turn their reproach. Lord, they're trying to reproach me. Turn it upon themselves. Lord, they're trying to shoot me. Let them shoot themselves. Lord, they're trying to make a play out of me. God, make a play out of them. Lord, they're trying to cover themselves up. Uncover them, my God. Lord, don't let their sin be blotted out. Lord, they've made you angry. Lord, they're attacking. 
attacking your children. Lord, they're attacking your church. Lord, they're attacking your ways. God, it ain't me. It's you they hate, God. Stand up, oh God, and fight your battle. And you and I stand and fight behind him. Anybody with me? Play to win. Verse 6 says this work is a big task. I'm still dealing with the work. I'll get to the weapons in a minute. Hang tight. I had me a 30-minute nap today. I feel like preaching half the night. Verse 6 says these words, So built we the wall. And the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. This building of the wall is a big task. There's all kind of places and principles in the Word of God where men of God, just like you and I, just plain, simple men of God, took on large and huge tasks because God Almighty wanted them to. Are you listening to me, gang? To build a Christian life that's worthy of looking at. To build a Christian life that's worthy of copying. To build a Christian life that's worthy of duplication. A Christian life that's worthy of the Savior who loves you and you love Him. It's a big task. We're in a world that hates God. We're in a place, mighty family, that hates the ways of the Lord. You and I living for God make them look bad. And so all they're going to try to do is get you and I looking bad and mess us up. But gang, I want you to know something right now. This work is huge and this work is mammoth. But this work is worthy. When God Almighty told an old 80 year old man, I want you to go back to Egypt and bring my children out. That was a big task. When God Almighty laid on Nehemiah's heart to build the walls of Jerusalem, it was a big task. The stones were down alongside the wall in the rubbish. There's a lot of rubbish. The work wasn't what bothered that crowd. It was the rubbish that they had to go through. And it's just like that with you and I. It ain't the work of Christianity to get you and I down so much. It's all this ungodly trash we've got to stomp through all the time. Right. All the junk, all the rigmarole, all the so-called hoops and loops and red tape and bureaucratic paperwork that they see no this permit, that permit, this idea, that idea, this permission, that permission. Gang, I'm here to tell you right now, nobody has to give God permission to do His work. He is God Almighty. And when you and I are doing God Almighty's work, that's why the believe the corner of me on the street corner. They say, you got a permit to preach here? I said, I sure do. And I hold up the Word of God. I said, my God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. We mean that you go down to City Hall and get a permit to preach in this corner. I don't have to ask permission to serve my God, sir. Amen. He said, preacher, did that get you in trouble? Yeah, it did. Got me in trouble. He said, what happened, preacher? I got out of it. My God came to my rescue. He took me right to the cruise from Manhattan, Pennsylvania. I said, sir, do you really and honestly want to do what you're doing? He said, I have to. He said, you're breaking the law. I said, I want to see the law. He said, you don't have to see the law, sir. I tell you, you're breaking the law. I said, sir, I'm a U.S. citizen. Until you show me the law that I'm breaking, you have no right to deal with me the way you are. Amen. Are you arresting me? He said, yeah, I am. I said, really? You can put me in that cruise? He said, I am. I said, under what, under what, under what uh, circumstances? What did I do wrong? He said, you're out here preaching the gospel. I said, sir, all against that in America? Well, you was right. I said, did your decimeter measure? <laughs> I said, I don't have a decimeter. I said, then how do you know I'm too loud? Right. He said, because I can hear you two blocks away. <laughs> I said, what's the decimal level here? He made up a number. That's all they do. They make up numbers. The sand bounds and Tobias make up numbers. If you read the rest of that story right there, you find that they made up all kinds of junk trying to stop the work of God. Right. So, preacher, what did you do? Was you mean? No, I wasn't mean to him. I just stood my ground. Right. He finally looked at me and he said, Listen, sir, he said, I'm going to let you go this time. I said, That's kind of you. He said, Don't you let me catch you out here again. I said, I'll be back tomorrow. I'm bringing another crew tomorrow. Amen. He never showed up. He didn't have a leg to stand on. I wasn't on private property. I wasn't hindering no woman. 
I stand on public land serving my God without a paper permit. You said, preacher, that's, that, that'll get you in trouble. So? You know how many people heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in a few days I was in Manaka, Pennsylvania? It doesn't matter whether you get in trouble or not. Are you going to serve God? Are you going to live for God? Work with God? Be with God? Are you going to build a wall? Does your heart say serve God? Does your heart say do something for Jesus Christ? Are you going to, are you going to, are you going to play to win? You know the work's big. You know the work's tedious. You know there's enemies on every hand. There's going to be enemies no matter what you do. I'd rather have the enemies of the other side against me than God Almighty. Amen. Amen, Gang, listen to me. If you compromise and become a sissy, right. you'll have us against you. We'll call you a sissy. We'll, we'll, we'll call you a compromiser. We'll call you a modernist. Make up your mind. You'd rather be a modernist and a sissy? Have us against you? Or would you rather be a tough man of God and have the sissies against you? I know they have the sissies against me. Because they can't hurt me. They don't have a leg to stand on. Right. Yeah, but Brother Don, what if they put you in prison? Well, what if they do? God Almighty got Peter out. Supposed to get me out. Man. Brother Don, the Apostle Paul spent most of his adult Christian life in prison. So, you ought to praise the Lord. How many books of that Bible do you get to read because of it? It was hard for him to walk and write. So God set him down to write. Think about it. Paul, we're going over here. Let's get in the ship. He said, no, I'm going to walk. Why? Because he only had a certain segment of people to deal with in the ship. But as he walked, he had town after town after town after town after town to serve God. Now besides Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, who was the greatest preacher that ever walked? Paul. Paul, you need to write some Bible. I ain't got time, God. I got souls to win. I got preaching to do. I got things to do. All of a sudden, here come the stinking soldiers. They'd hog time and put him in prison. He'd sit down in the prison. God said, I told you, I want you to write. He said, okay, God, okay. What do you want me to write? He said, well, here it is, ready? And God would dictate it to him. Paul write it down. 14 books of the New Testament. What are you saying, Brother Don? I'm saying, my dear family, listen to me. It don't matter where we end up in God's economy. God is there. God is for us. God will protect us. God will watch over us. He's even going to be so gracious one of these days to deliver us from this robe of flesh. I'll drop and rise. I'm telling you, one of these days, He's going to finally, for all, once and for all, deliver us out of this entire mess, my love. And the world can have what they got. They think they got something going for them. Poor, deceived fools, they have no clue. Right in the middle of their utopia, God Almighty is going to start raining hailstones. There are going to be monsters and boogers and spookamans everywhere. And this world's going to go nuts for three and a half years while the judgment of God stomps them into hell. Are you listening to me, church? While that's going on, we're at home. I'll talk about work and weapons. I'll just go to the weapons so we can go home sometime tonight. Look at verse 9 with me, please. Look at a weapon you and I can use to serve God with as we build our Christian life. Nehemiah says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. You know what one of the weapons you can use is to get your head out of the sand. Quit pretending like they ain't there. Quit pretending like they ain't going to attack you. If you name the name of Christ, you better run, depart from iniquity, because your enemy, the devil, is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Get your head out of the sand. You're next. One of the weapons of warfare that you and I can use is a weapon of preparedness. The brother talked about leaving up here. I thought, well, he's going to bounce off a part of my message already. Hallelujah. You've got to be prepared for what's coming at you. I pray every day. I'm, I'm going to say it all right. I pray every day. Every day. Every morning in our prayer time. After our devotions. Uh, we have prayer time. I pray every day. Are you listening to me? I pray every single day. Are you listening on the internet? I pray every single day for the evil and 
anti-God, anti-American government than we're in right now. I pray for the salvation of Obama, Michelle, his girls, the cabinet, the Senate, the Congress, the Supreme Court, the governors and the mayors of our land. Did you hear me out there, world? I pray for the salvation of the leadership of our country. Why, preacher? Because my dear family, the only thing that's going to salvage that bunch up there is if they find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Until that time, they're going to die and go to hell, every one of them. From Obama down to the mayor. They're going to die and go to hell without Christ. Unless somebody's got enough grit and gut to witness to them. I know they're monitoring the internet. Let them hear it. They need to hear it. Jesus Christ suffered, went, and died, and rose again to save them from their sin, just like He done us. Amen. Their rejection of Jesus Christ is going to damn them into a devil's hell. Somebody up there, somebody in Congress, somebody in the Senate, somebody around the White House needs to stand firm and witness to that bunch of Satan worshipers. That's what needs to happen. That outfit's anti-American and anti-God. And somebody needs to get them to Jesus Christ. Why, preacher? Because, my dear family, without Christ there is no hope. For man, woman, boy, or girl, I don't care who it is. Then I pray for Israel. I know what Ezekiel 38 says. I know what Daniel says. I know what the Revelation says. And every day of my life, I pray for the leadership of Israel to be wise and get some knowledge and believe the Bible. I pray every day that they'll find out that Jesus Christ really is the Messiah. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I ask God to bless Jerusalem. And I know who peace is. It's coming to Jerusalem to sit on His Father David's throne and rule this world with a rod of iron. And I pray every day that Israel will find God Almighty and the leadership will turn to the Bible and find the answers to that which is coming at them and turn to Christ before it happens. Amen. Say, preacher, you go get in trouble talking like that. I'm already in trouble with the devil. And he's the father of all of them people. All lost people's fathers, the devil, God Almighty said so in the book of John. You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, you will do. Gang, listen to me. One of our weapons is be prepared. Get your head out of the sand. Well, preacher, we ought not be involved in that. We, as God's people, are involved in everything. 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 Well, you're not allowed to do that. That ain't got nothing to do with that. That law don't apply to me. I'm God's child. You're not allowed to solicit here. I'm not selling nothing. I'm giving you a gospel track. You're not allowed to do that here. We don't allow that here. You do not control my Christianity. You don't want the gospel track? Fine. Throw it away when I leave. But I ain't picking it up. There it is. Brother Don, uh, it's against the law. Whose law? Brother Don, you, you causing trouble? No, I'm declaring war. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941. Remember the speech? Now, Roosevelt was a snake. He was a compromising, sissified, passive snake. But he finally got pushed into declaring war against the enemy of the United States. And a great speech he gave on December 7th, 1941. I'm declaring war. And I'm not a sissy. I'm declaring war on sin. Man. Not people. Sin. And if you'll pray for me, and God will help me. Miss Sarah, I'm going to name it. I'm going to expose it. I'm going to uncover it. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to preach again it. But whatever happens, happens. We do not have time to play church any longer. Amen. We've got two and almost three generations of people on the ground right now that don't know anything about God. 
the 40-year-olds, the 20-year-olds, and they're having babies. The third generation's coming that doesn't know anything about taking a stand for Christ. Preacher, what's wrong with them? It ain't them. We backed off, backed up, compromised, got lazy, stuck our head in the sand, said it won't happen to me. But now that it's happening to us, we're crying, belly aching, griping. After the fact, it's too late to fuss. When it was coming at us, now listen to me, We've, we have been... We have been given this. Somewhere, somewhere back in the early 1900s, they started backing out and backing off. Somewhere back there after Billy Sunday, somewhere back there, they started giving in and caving in and, and folding up. And, and, and then, and then again, listen to me. They, they decided, they decided to to to, to soft soap and candy coat and sugar ice. In the sixties, listen when them when uh, when the Beatles came across the water in the sixties, the American church should have stood up and said, "You volunteer devils, go back to England where you belong. We don't need you over here corrupting our kids." When the rock music, the rap music, and all that bunch started their mess, God's people should have stood up and said, that don't happen in our city. Amen. You get your trash music out of our town. Amen. There used to be a day when people were scared to death of what the church might say or think. Right. Used to be there. Now they laugh at us. Right. They make fun of us. Why? Because our forefathers caved. And you and I have inherited that cave. Now some of us are trying to stand up against that which is wrong and they mock us and laugh at us and make fun of us. And Why don't you hold up a sign that says repent or else? They think we're funny. It's time God's people declared war. And one of the weapons of our warfare is preparedness. Verse 13 and 14, the Bible says these words, Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. One of the weapons of, of, of our great war, my dear family, is not only the weapon of preparedness, but the weapon of inspiration. We are an uninspired group anymore. We need inspired. Nehemiah, in the 14th verse, he said, listen, he said, be you not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Fight for your brethren. We've become so isolated, so individualized now that if a brother or sister gets in some kind of a jam, we just back off and wait to see what's going to happen. We're supposed to come to the rescue. We're supposed to inspire each other to live right and do right, not stand behind them and gossip about them on that wicked, dirty Facebook. That thing is still out of hell. Facebook still is. It's one of the most vilest church destroying devices that Satan ever invented. Yeah. It does nothing but give cowards an opportunity to gossip about each other. That's all it does. Right. Yeah. They won't come talk to you face to face, so they Facebook it with their friends, with their Sabbaths and their Tobias, their Ammonites, their armies of Samaria. Destroying and tearing down and messing up. Damn, listen to me right now. Once you find out what they're saying about you, then you don't fellowship with them no more. It's called splits and divisions. I know a preacher in New York had to get off of Facebook because he learned too much about his own congregation and he said, if I stay on Facebook, I won't be able to love them or preach to them anymore. So he got off of it. So preacher, what's going on? I'm saying, my dear family, we are living in a strange and odd world and we need to be inspired to serve God and live for God and love God and work with God. And that talks about you get there. I need to inspire you. So preacher, what, what, 
I, I, I need some kind of stimulant. Why? Ain't you saved? Ain't that enough? Okay, I'm going to give you a stimulant to live for God. You want one? You want a stimulant to live for God? This is yes, the Panama City. You want a stimulant to live for God? You want a poke to live for God? You want a reason to live for God? Huh? Look back there in the corner at them two little people. Look. Turn around and look. Miss Sarah, stand up and show me Jonah. Stand up, sweetheart. Jonah. You want an inspiration to live for Jesus Christ? Jonah. Then two children right there. That boy right there. Right there's a reason to live for God. Right there's a reason to be faithful in church, love Jesus, serve God, do right, read your Bible every day, pray all the time. There's a reason. There's a little girl right there. There's a real good reason. A little old cute girl right there. There's a real good reason to live for God. You want to inspire? Amen. There it is. What's going to happen to that baby if you and I decide to compromise any further? Yes. We give up. Amen. We quit. We're done. Had enough of this fight. I know this war. I'm tired of fighting. Let somebody else do it now. And what's that baby going to do? Yeah. What's these boys going to do? Right. Well, good grief. If Daddy and the preacher man and old brother Don's give out, there ain't nothing I can do. And they junk it out. What would Jonah say if Uncle Paul quit? What's Jonah going to do if Grandma Sheila stops? You ever read about the old church? You ever be about the church in the 1800s? Right. Uh -huh. You ever be about the revivals of the 1800s? Right. Yeah. Did you ever pick up an old book and read about old Finney? Yeah. That old man of God come into town and sit down for about three weeks. They come talk to him every day. Hey, Charles Finney, it's time. Everybody's gathered up at the meeting house. Come on. He said, ain't time yet. Ain't coming. <coughs> Finney, yeah. Uh, there's twice as many people there tonight as there was last night. It's time to come. No, it ain't. I'll be there directly. About the time the Holy Ghost told Charles Finney to head to the meeting house, he'd get up out of the railroad station or up out of the boarding house, wherever it was, and he'd just start walking towards the meeting house. And as he walked down the street or whatever city he was in, listen, I preached all over in the north, in New York country, where, where Finney marched through the land. I preached every year in a town called Ithaca, New York. That used to be called Sodom, Sodom. The mayor was named Lot. He went to Rochester and found Finney and said, I need you to come to Sodom and preach the Word of God. Finney went down there and preached the Word of God. Such a revival broke out in Sodom that they stopped and city council changed the name to Ithaca. It's Ithaca today. Amen. Amen. Brother Don, man, that must have been something. Uh-huh, it was. Ithaca, New York today is the, is the headquarters of Cornell University. Ithaca today is the Sodomite capital of the East. You can get a bachelor's degree in homosexuality at Cornell. Now what you do with it, I have no clue. The man I preached for up there was in the print shop at Cornell University. He printed all the tests. For the professors, he told me out of his own mouth, every test had homosexuality raked all through it. Engineering, doctoring, agriculture, whatever, had homosexuality and lesbianism raked all through their tests. He said, I had to quit. He said, some of the professors even had pictures. Taught their kids how to grow corn with the pictures and explaining that lifestyle. Are you, you said, what are you saying? I'm saying, my dear family, listen to me. We need inspired.
You take a look at your televisions tonight when you go home. It ought to inspire you to serve God. Why, preacher? I don't have a TV. I ain't had one since 81, but I'm telling you, point blank, they tell me there's some stuff on that television, son, that ain't fit for blind people to look at. They tell me there's a whole lot of shows that got a whole lot of devil devils in it. We were someplace one time that had it on and had this modern family on. Anybody know about a modern family? And ain't nothing but deviants, perverts, knotheads, creeps and crubs. Are you listening to me, gang? It ain't a modern family at all. Right. It's what they want to be a modern family. Do you not understand, love, not only these fine children in here, but the wickedness of this world ought to inspire us to live for God Almighty in the midst of it. That they may have a contrast. There's a church in Ohio. They go to every single gay parade in the city. Stand there with a sign that says, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And they asked him, why would you come to this? He said, just so they know, everybody here ain't the way they are. He doesn't say a word. So you say a word around that crowd, they attack. So he just simply stands there. And it got so that the police would stand around him and guard him. While he simply stood there with that sign and said, Trust Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now shall be saved. And different Bible verses about salvation. He wasn't there to antagonize. He wasn't there to aggravate them. He was simply there to witness to them. He was inspired because of their filth. He was inspired to witness. Fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons, your wives, your daughters, your houses, your church, your preacher, his wife. Stand your ground here in Panama City. Amen. Here comes the city, boys. Well, I'm glad you come. What do you want? Well, we need to talk to you. Well, just hold on a minute. Let me make about three or four or five phone calls. Uh, and you call the brethren and say, hey, you ain't got nothing to do. I got the city here. I want you to come help me. We're going to talk to these city boys about Jesus. He said, Preacher, I, I, I got to take care of this myself. No, the preacher don't take care of this by himself. This is not the preacher's church. This is the Lord Jesus Christ's church. And as a member of this church, you're part of the great family of God. Then you stand together and you inspire each other to stand against that which is evil and take your licks. Do you realize we're going to revoke your, uh, your uh, tax thing? Revoke it. Do you realize we're going to shut your doors? Hush. Shut the doors. What well, big deal? What's, what's that going to do? Well, we'll shut your doors. You can't have church here. You'd be surprised how many men will fold up when they're told they're not allowed to have church in that building anymore. Gang, you can't stop the church. Amen. I don't need a building this nice and this fine and you've done a great job of fixing it up. I say that to you. But I'm telling you, poor man, if they come and tell you you're never allowed to use this building again, it does not stop the church of the living God. You gather up someplace, get in the yard somewhere, get in the park somewhere, sing the songs of Zion somewhere, and let God get the victory in this thing. Somebody needs to inspire us in our day. We cave because they say. We fold because they had to tell us to. When God Almighty's people need to stand, so, Nehemiah quit building the wall. No, I ain't quitting building the wall. This is what God told me to do. I'm not stopping building my Christian life. God told me to do that. I'm not stopping having church. You might get me out of my building, but I'm still going to have church. John had church on the Isle of Patmos, and he was the only one in the congregation. Jesus was the preacher. Paul had church at midnight with old silence. Jesus singing and having him a big time. And the jailer and his whole family got saved by the grace of God. What a fancy, beautiful building like y'all's. It's a stinking dungeon got nothing to do with church church is you Amen. your church can't stop the church Amen. you know they had to kill every Christian on the world's face to stop the church impossible let me give you another weapon can I do it you still out there someplace preach you know you'll preach all night I told you I had a nap Verse 15, 16, and 20 says, It came to pass when our enemies heard it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, we returned all of us to the wall. We returned. 
Now, I'm not going to ask you tonight. I could, though. I could ask you how many of you need to return to the wall, to the work of God. Everyone unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that half my servants wrought in the work. Half of them held both the spears and shields and the bows and halberdines. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. Do you see that? The rulers were behind all the house of Judah. Verse 20. In what place thereof you hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort hither to us. Our God shall fight for us. I'm telling you. Number three, the weapon of the weapon of support. Amen. Look at me, love. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Are you for me or against me? I happen to be a brother. Amen. Saved by the grace of God, my family, just like you. Washed in the blood of Jesus, just like you. Are you for me or against me? I'm not asking do you agree with me on every jot and tittle. I'm asking you, are you for me or against me? The weapon of support is a great weapon against the enemy. When they realize they might not be able to buffalo five or ten or twenty or fifty of you. Uh, Brother Daly, uh, Pastor Daly, we like to see you down at City Hall at 9.30 on Tuesday morning. Uh, uh, we've got something to discuss with you. Hey folks, i got to go to City Hall at 9.30 on Tuesday morning. Uh, uh, please pray for me. No, come. When the state of Texas got after Lester Roloff, the judge looked him right dead in the eye and said, you ain't got a million dollars to fix this. He said, no, but I got a million friends with a dollar. <laughs> and when they come to get him, guess what happened? Texas got invaded. I didn't get in on it because I wasn't aware of it until after it happened. But Texas got invaded by men of God, people of God. And they went down there and the pictures show they stood around and they showed they was not going to let them in there. That's what needs to happen here. When the Sam Bouts and Tobias and it'll be the religious crowd that will attack this great church for trying to have revival. It'll be the religious bunch. I'll tell you what you need to do, Lighthouse. You need to keep that stuff inside your own walls and quit bothering us with it. You need to come down here, sir, and explain what you're doing up there at your church. And about that time, every one of you walk in that, in that house down there, every one of you walk in that courthouse, every one of you walk in that civil man's office, every one of you walk in and say, what are you all doing here? Well, listen, if you're dealing with one of us, you're dealing with all of us. You're, you're fighting against God, and we're God's people. We've come to help you. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, sir, or ma'am? Uh, no. Well, you need to because Jesus is coming. And if all of you stood together, I'm telling you right now, gang, they would not push us so far. Amen. But we're a bunch of cowards, my love, and we let each individual fight their own battles. We'll pray for you, brother. Well, the weapon of support is better because you may not have to say a word. You simply walk in. Now you listen to me real close. I'm trying to quit and can't. Our son was in a tragic accident in July. It wasn't his fault. Nothing like that. But a woman was killed. And he's going through it now. We done been to his arraignment. Done been to his pre-trial. And now we're going to another pre-trial on the 19th of November. That's when we'll pick up the books, by the way. The 19th of November, we're going to another pre-trial. The boy's in Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. So what he said, he's got a great lawyer, his company hired him a great lawyer, it looks like everything's fine and down, it looks like we're going to win this thing, and it's going to be a great blessing, that's a fact. Okay? I'm going to be in that in Mississippi. Except on the morning of the 19th, I'm going to be at his house. Yeah. Why, preacher? Because the weapons of support yeah. are powerful weapons. He told us at the, at the last pre-trial, he said, listen, he said, he said, now you two don't know, said, I know you're going to be deep south, you don't need to come back up for that. We said, we're going to be with you, son. Amen. No matter what happens, boy, we're going to be right there with you in this. Amen. So, preacher, why are you putting out all, listen, he's our son, what do you mean, why? Right. This is your church, what do you mean, Why? That's your preacher. What do you mean, why? This family's blood is thicker than our family's blood with our son. 
thick or thin, hell or high water. We stick together. We don't let anybody go through nothing alone. We stay with them. We hang tight. We stay together. We lock elbows. We get down on our knees. We beg and cry to God. Hear, O oh God, our prayer. God, the enemy is attacking. God in heaven, they are going to hinder the world. Lord, they want to stop this building, this wall. God, they want to stop me from living a Christian life. They want to stop Brother Paul from living a Christian life. They want to stop Miss Sarah from living a Christian life. God, we ain't going to let them do that. God, help us. We're going to stand together. And the weapon of support. Well, you don't have to come. I, I know I don't have to, but I'm going to. Well, yeah, but you really can't afford that. It ain't got nothing to do with afford. Man. Richard, it's just so expensive. So was your debt when you bought your car and your house and your refrigerator and that 53-foot TV in your house. You don't mind going in debt for that kind of stuff. Why don't you mind going in some kind of a debt for each other? That new living room suit you didn't pay cash for. You re-roofed your house and made payments on it. Why not make payments for the brethren? Weapons. Weapons. Of preparedness, of inspiration, of support and last. The 21st verse said, So we labored in the work. Half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Suppose they was tired. Suppose they was weary. Suppose they was sweaty and nasty. He said in that one text right there, he said, we didn't even take our clothes off except for washing. Imagine how good they smelled about three in the afternoon. What's that fourth weapon, preacher? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The weapon of steadfastness. Brother Don, I'm tired and weary of the battle. Who ain't? Who ain't mentally drained? Come on, be honest. Look around you. Look beside that. You think that man is not by trained, mentally drained, passing his church, God and see you, think he's mentally drained sometimes? Trying to figure you out? Huh? <laughs> Trying to figure yourself out? Come on now. Every one of us goes through this stuff, get mentally drained. I mean, down to the place where you just can't think or can't think, function in the brain. We all get there. But that ain't got no place, that ain't no, that ain't no quitting, that ain't no quitting zone. Amen. It's a recruitment zone, but not a quitting zone. That's why we have church services. This week we're really going to be blessed. We've got to release that. We're going to do Friday. Amen. That means Amen. we're going to do parts of the recoup. going to revamp, re re restock, re-up, re re-enlist, uh, re-meet, whatever. Amen. Get back at it. Amen. Me, me and that one there had a little bit of a rift. Well, rifts, rifts are normal. There's no quick zone on a rift. Amen. Just come back together again. Forgive and forget, go on. <coughs> Brother Don, I, 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 I'm looking for greener pastures. There ain't none. It's all brown. <laughs> it's brown here. It's brown there. <laughs> Amen. Don't worry about greener pastures. Don't quit. Don't give up. There's a weapon in your hands. There's a weapon in your heart. It's the weapon of steadfastness. We can name here for the night. But what comes in the moment? Joseph. Yes. It's almost morning. You hear that song of the Paul that day? It's almost morning. Do you understand that it's almost morning? You know one of these days there's going to be a light in the eastern sky that ain't nobody's ever seen before? Amen. Do you understand we're going home for just one day? Amen. We're only going to be in heaven one day. You can that. Just one day. We're going to go to the land where some night. Amen. <laughs> just go home for the day. That's all. We're going to take the day home. <laughs> he 
روی شفرش آن رو با آز به هم نیمه ها کنگاه نیمه مانه یه نیمه شکا پیسوانی شکا یه نیمه کوه این کوه یه نیمه کار در ویر یه نیمه این 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 کار در ویر یه نیمه Do you understand, my love, this is day 50? And on the 52nd day, some glorious daybreak, Jesus will come. Come on, baby, I'll preach all night if you can come on. He's going to split that eastern sky and we're leaving. This is the 50th day for this church house. Have you read your Bible? This is the 50th day for the child of God. Have you read the Word of God? Jesus said that He's going to wax worse and worse and worse and worse. Will you see this and see this and see this and see this? And see this? Look up. Your redemption draw up now. I'm telling you, church, we're almost home. Man. Don't quit now. Don't stop now. Don't give up now. Timothy, you have all war a good warfare. Yes. How? How? Use the weapons of God gives you. Be prepared, inspired, support each other, and be steadfast at it. Son, think. I'm trying to quit. Think. I gave you four weapons and you ain't got two hands. You got a couple of spares. Half of them worked here, half of them worked there. But every worker had a trial or something in one hand and a spear or a sword in the other. And they worked and they fought. And they worked and they fought. And they worked and they fought. And in 52 days they accomplished the task. And Sambalat and Tobiah and the Ammonites and the Arabians and all the rest of that bunch of devils, the sons of Ishmael, couldn't stop God. Amen. And God can't stop you either. Do you hear me? God would have never started you. He said, when I had begun you, I will perform it in the name of Jesus Christ. God Himself wouldn't even stop you. Let alone the sad mouths of your day. Are we marching to Zion? Beautiful, beautiful Zion. Yes. When this is over, we should wear a crown. How can we sing in the songs and not believe? Right. Right. <coughs> Stick your arms up. Yep. Stick your arms up. Yep. Yep, yep. I see everyone's got two names. One to work. One to fight. War and good warfare. Heads guys. Preacher, God has touched me, convicted me, and spoke to my heart tonight. Anybody like it? And what are you doing sitting in your seat? Come. Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. Sing them. Is it nothing to you, O oh, he that passed by? Hand in hand, both of your hands. Is it nothing to you, and to God, fill my hands with work and weapons, God. If our freedom should die, can't you see he that our land and all we hold dear soon will pass away. Is it nothing to you? God, we pray that you'd withhold your hand of judgment from our land. Give us men who will preach, who'll be strong and take a stand and never fall in the fight. And never move from what is right. 
Is it nothing? Is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you that lost sinners will die? Is it nothing to you? Can't you hear their sad cry? They are lost without hope. Oh, what can they do? They are dying alone. Is it nothing to you? Jesus died their souls to save. He so life he freely gave. But think of those who are unsaved, lost forever and forever, and through all eternity, darkness sees their destiny. Is it nothing? Is it nothing to you? Praise, he tells you to pray. Is it nothing to you that lost sinners will die? Is it nothing to you? Can't you hear so the sad cry? They are lost without hope. Oh, what can they spirit. do? They are dying alone. Is it nothing not to you? Jesus died their souls to save. He so life he freely gave. But think of those who are unsaved, lost forever and forever, and through all eternity. Darkness sees their destiny. Is it nothing? Is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you? Oh, he that pass by is it nothing to you if I freedom should die can't you see that our land and all we hold dear soon will pass away is it nothing to you? God, we pray that you'd withhold your hand of judgment from our land. Give us men who will preach, who'll be strong and take a stand and never falter in the fight and never move from what is right. Is it nothing? Is it nothing to you? Is it nothing? Is it nothing?